Today, we're going to talk a little bit more about the Tesla Model 3 2170 battery. Often I am. Put me in mind of a first uh, principle at EVTV. I'm a little past my sell by date, a little out of breath, low energy. So we've kind of fallen away from some of that and started just stealing information from others on the internet. And uh, this is, is something I discovered in batteries years ago. A lot of what's known about them uh, is simply copied from scientific paper to scientific paper under the assumption that it's good, and often it isn't. This isn't on YouTube. This is among academics who do the same thing. And so we uh, have a long tradition at EVTV of uh, seeing, that although a mighty big, it would take a mighty big dog to weigh a ton to put our own scale on it, just as uh, Mr. Lasoy, um uh, Mark <laughs> uh, did uh, to us. So I said I might uh, do some testing of the battery cell. Uh, long time EV viewers um, they remind me of uh, watching some paint dry. We used to refer to it as watching grass grow or watching the paint dry. And uh, we're kind of infamous for it. And worse, and I really don't want to hear from you about automated test equipment. Automated test equipment tends to have canceling errors in some cases, but often just error piled on error. And it gets to be uh, a very interesting. Um, so we... Uh, kind of do some really basic stuff. I have learned to rely on a uh, um, desktop multimeters that'll give me four or five digits of decimal precision. I uh, rely on those pretty well. I like fluke meters. We start, Mr. James Grosh made me a little assembly here, which is a... Uh, Tesla battery holder. As I noted, here, here, somewhere, we don't have a little button sticking up. And so we have to be able to firmly contact the cathode. And of course, the can is our anode. <coughs> so we took a small, I call them a pill, but a small cylinder uh, magnet. And he took two pieces of Lexan here and drilled the hole about 21, 22 millimeters in the first one. And then a very small hole all the way through the second one in the center. And then down halfway into the hole with a, uh, uh, a diameter of this pill magnet. And we uh, ran the wires through the hole, soldered it to the magnet and then epoxy the magnet into the socket in the upper piece uh, to hold that. And I added these two pieces of threaded rod so we could clamp it together to an ordinary terminal bar, a small one, and that lets us do some things. We put two wires on the cathode and two on the anode. Our current carrier is a little bit bigger wire and then our voltage sense wires, and that's what you see displayed on the multimeter. Right now, 4.1953 volts, pretty close to 4.2, which is fully charged. The uh, current carriers, we actually run through a uh, 10 amp, 100 millivolt um, device here. Let me, uh, I always lose a couple of decimal places here. So let's see. Um, Ten. Uh, 
divided by uh, hmm. well anyway a 0.01 resistor um, and a kind of a precision one and so at 100 millivolts across this uh, 10 amp shunt we would be carrying 10 amps of current and I'm using a Fluke 223 here to actually measure the voltage across that and so we can get a pretty fine on our millivolts DC setting get a pretty good indication of how many millivolts is across that shunt and that will tell us our current. Um, this is a candy little thing I got, told you I had on order from Banggood, a Chinese gadget guy, and it is a uh, constant current load, but it only does about nine amps uh, at this voltage. So it's small, got a little fan on it, but it, it ostensibly holds the current constant. And that's what we need is a load. And a constant current load would be even better. This is a constant current, constant, constant voltage power supply, 0 to 30 volts. And um, it'll do 10 amps as well. Um, and this is an iPhone. that can't recognize my face but we use that as a stopwatch a clock and we're going to do this by time if we um, do a discharge into our load at a constant current um, we can calculate ampere hours quite easily. What we're really wanting here is a uh, discharge curve that shows us not only how many amp hours, but the actual curve that we can then graph and use um, much as we use the discharge curve on the Model S batteries um, all the time. And in this case, we can do it with the uh, uh, Model 3 then. And we'll publish that curve, of course, uh, for your use. Um, so we have 46% increase in volume and um, about the same in weight. Um, and so we should get at least that much um, amp hours. Now, measuring this thing and testing batteries is not precisely what you think. Um, everyone likes to be authoritative and accurate, and they tend to overstate their resolution a bit. Fully charged is about 4.2 volts. A lot of people charge to 4.3 volts. And fully discharged is about 3 volts but some discharge to 2.8 volts well what's going on here well for one thing the voltage varies based on the current even though we're tapping the voltage at the cell and not measuring through our current conductor and that's because when you're drawing current like this you'll have some voltage drop in the wires and the connections Whereas the multimeter has very high impedance, it doesn't have a voltage drop through the small wires. And obviously we don't need as big a wire. And so we're going to measure the voltage at the cell terminals and then use separate wiring to do the uh, discharge or the charge. So that's what's going on here. Um, we're gonna start at 4.2 volts. Well, the issue that I was getting to is that um, voltage is one thing um, under a load, a current discharge or charge, and it is quite different 
when you release it and have no current charging or discharging. We'll call that static voltage. And if you're drawing current or putting current in, we'll call that load voltage. And that tends to get to be a little confused. Then we have another problem. Your voltages will vary based on how much current we're talking about. And indeed, that can extends into the battery cell itself. And so you'll typically see discharge curves, in the scientific community anyway, at um, different C rates. C is your capacity of your cell. And we're going to say just broadly, this is nominally, at a C of 5 amp hours. We don't know where it's at exactly, that's why we're doing the measurement, but roughly 5C. So let's say we get 5 amp hours if we discharge it at 0.1C. Well, that would be a half a volt or a half an amp. Um, and we get our 5 amp hours. If we do it at 5 amps or 1C, we're not going to get the same um, output of the battery. It would typically be less than we see at 0.1C. And so you have a series of curves of discharge at 0.1C, 0.25C, 0.5C, 0.75C, and 1C is typically a, a solid battery test. And those curves will vary with uh, temperature, for one thing, uh, but with this discharge rate primarily. One of the interesting artifacts of, uh, as you know, Tesla is acquiring Maxwell Technologies. I know you think of those as capacitor manufacturers, and a lot of you desperately want a capacitor in an electric vehicle. It's not going in there, and there's good and plenty of reasons why. This is kind of like the hydrogen car debate, but we also have a capacitor religion that somehow, if we add a capacitor, we can triple the range of a battery-powered car. It, it's just not so, and we proved that many years ago. Maxwell, the reason Tesla is acquiring them, is because of a dry-coated electrode process that they have. And it was designed to eliminate a big, ugly, battery manufacturing horror shit show par excellence called the drying oven. This thing, uh, when you make the battery, you take your active materials and you mix it with uh, a polymer, uh, kind of a glue. And, and the, the glue has a solvent in it. Um, I actually have the name of that here. N-methylpyrolidone. N-methylpyrolidone. N-M-P. And this stuff is just a freaking horror. It's highly flammable. You can't have any electronic equipment really in the room with a dryer. Anything that would produce sparks will blow your battery factory sky high. It's toxic at, at an unbelievable level. It's not that you don't want to eat this stuff or breathe it. You don't even want to look at it. It's so toxic. And then... Uh, you have to dry it out. So the drying oven is uh, often 20, 30, 60 feet long. And it's a vacuum chamber, typically. Not a high vacuum, but a little bit of vacuum. And then heat. Uh, IR lamps or something. 
to quickly evaporate this um, NMP solvent. This has nothing to do with the solvent in the electrolytes. This is the solvent in the binder, the glue, that we're going to use to mix up our, our, our active material and print it on the foil. Once it's printed on the foil, we have to evaporate the solvent and that'll leave all our active material in kind of a rough, porous um, coating on the current collector, the foil. It's like offset printing. It's, it's not a little bit like offset printing. It is offset printing, except you have to use this nasty solvent uh, to bind your active materials to make the ink. And so you have this horrendous drying mechanism and you can't roll it up to store it or to use it somewhere else in the assembly until it is thoroughly dry. Well, the drying requires a certain amount of time in the presence of heat and a little bit of vacuum will in decrease the drying time. And so you wind up with your roll mechanism running at a certain speed. And uh, the uh, and you can't go any faster than that because it has to have a certain amount of time in that tunnel um, to dry. Now, if you speed it up, you you can't. It's not there for the same time. Well, the trade-off there is you can make the oven longer, and they tend to be pretty long because of this. You can run them faster if they're longer. But it's not really a linear trade-off. So a lot longer tunnel gives you a little faster assembly speed. Things a shit show. Then the solvent, you can't just let it dry. You've got to capture this and distill it back into liquid form. I mean, the EPA will not let you release it into the atmosphere, but it wouldn't matter. You, all your you know, employees would be sick most of the time if uh, you didn't. So it's uh, captured, distilled, and um, could theoretically be reused, or you have to pay a ship pot to uh, dispose of it as a hazardous material. But anyway, you got to get it out of the air of the factory. So the process at Maxwell is not to use it at all. Instead of um, using a solvent, you use a little bit different polymer in granular form and mix it with um, your active material. And then you sprinkle that on the fo foil going into a heated roller. And this the, the active materials are all crystalline, crystalline granules. They're very hard. They're sharp, actually. Um, and so compressing and heating those isn't going to do anything. But the uh, polymer granules will soften and flatten. And at some percentage of your active materials being these polymer granules, it will make a mat and glue all this together anyway. And there's a lot of um, optimization that can go in there. And so the interesting part is coming out of the fusion roller, you don't, not only don't have to heat it, you kind of have to cool it. And so instead of 60 feet evaporating this horrifying solvent, how about four feet and nothing? Well, that's why Elon bought this company. He can crank it up to 11 and go into ludicrous mode on his assembly line. 
And the guy walks around with his iPhone in the factory timing assembly lines. That's what he's all about. He wants them to run fast enough that air resistance becomes a significant factor. That's his mission. He's extended that to the boring company's drill and that you guys have got to make it go through the earth faster than a snail. And he's standing there with a phone, the stopwatch, same one I use. So that's uh, what's going on with Maxwell. Now, how, do, how can I bring this all back home um, to a discharge rate? The whole thing is a manufacturing process improvement. The length of the assembly line is decreased by a factor of 16. The solvents go away. It's a manufacturing process scheme. And it worked extremely well on their very similar electrodes for the capacitors they were making. And they drastically decreased their costs, space requirements, uh, and, and increase the speed of the production of their ultra capacitors. The whole capacitor, capacitors are fascinating devices, and many of you have been trying to wedge them into an electric car forever. The problem is they're a left handed monkey wrench in a world of crescent sockets, craftsman sockets. It's just the wrong tool for the wrong job all the time. And their principal advantage was they could put out a shit pot full of current very quickly. The problem is the advances in the lithium batteries have got them to where they'll put out current at very nearly the same rate. How much current do you need? Well, you need enough to drive that motor and at its top rate. And the whole Tesla thing, they'll accept range, they like range, but they wanted to use commodity camera and laptop batteries to drive the car, and they wanted it, they started with Martin Eberhard's two-seat sports car. The whole concept is electric cars don't have to be like golf cart. They can be high performance. So the Tesla Roadster, was specifically to demonstrate that zero to 60 speed and that exhilarating acceleration. And that required a certain amount of motor power, which required a certain amount of current. And to get that out of laptop batteries, you wound up with a shit pot full of them. So great, we can go 260 miles on a charge. That will sell but it was all about the current and the current capability of the batteries. Once you have enough to hit that motor at max, getting more current doesn't do anything. You don't need it for your cigarette lighter and your um, radio. It's to drive that motor. In the case of four-wheel drive, two motors. But the, the Tesla battery pack already provides more, and I'm by more, I mean much more, than the motors can handle now. So, the, the capacitors don't really have a role. And Maxwell has, I bought Maxwell capacitors for the gym before we did our first um, EV in 2008. And in fact, in 2010, I spent $10,000 in about two weeks building a 120 volt Maxwell capacitor to run with our 1957 Speedster. It was four foot long, two feet wide. It weighed 110 pounds and it had no effect on the car at all. In fact, we lost acceleration. And so I learned my capacitor lesson there. So here's Maxwell. They're doing a great job at building a fascinating, fantastic device for which there is no known use. 
a classic solution to something that's no longer a problem because of the advancements in the lithium battery cell technology. They're just not needed. So Maxwell is furiously in the, the process of they said, hey, we might be able to steal a march on the lithium battery business because this could dramatically cost, drop the cost of manufacture. So they tried the process on some lithium iron phosphate cells and they got a fabulous result. So they tried it on some NCM cells. They got the same fabulous result. And they tried them on the NCA cells and they got the same thing. I think I know why. I'm not sure they do. However, that's not the story. The story is that that disparity between the capacity of the cell at different um, discharge rates was flattened by half. Now there's still a disparity between 1C discharge and 0.1C, but it's half of the disparity that it was. And the other thing was the cycle life of the cells went bananas, over 2,000 uh, cycles. That's like life po 4 cells, but for the NCMs and NCAs. So there were two very significant advantages in, in the performance of the cell that they were just trying to make sure they could do as well as using this new manufacturing process, which is less costly by a lot. And so uh, that's, that's all good news. Better, it introduces a number of variables. Variables are kind of cool things. Uh, they can drive you crazy. In this case, of course, they add a, uh, a current enhancer, current additive, um, and everybody uses pretty much carbon. If you recall from the old days of A123 batteries, that came out of MIT, where they used an extremely fine carbon particular, particular as an additive to the cathode materials, and, and they were making a battery that would do 20 C. It was an extreme uh, high current battery using this current additive with some very thin coatings of uh, cathode material. Um, so you have your current additive, but there is a huge variation you can apply to the size of the polymer granules and the percentage of your powdered mixture that would be polymer granules. And then of course the pressure of the um, fusion roll and the temperature of the fruit fusion roll and all of that combined with the speed at which we're going through the fusion roll you see how you have all these variables. Well, that's nice because you change one of them and see what the effect is on the battery. If the performance goes down, you do less of that. If the performance goes up, you do more of that. And then you have the next variable that you test for the same way. And then some of the variables interact. And so this can take years to optimize the uh, process. Now they say they have a 300 kilowatt um, per um, or 300 watt hours per gram um, energy density as opposed to 246. Well, energy density at what discharge rate? You see, we're back to the variation in the capacity, and they flatten that curve. So for any given discharge rate beyond zero, they're going to have exhibit a higher energy density because they can do the same capacity at a higher rate. Um, the same with cycle life. And so... It takes a long time to test those 
um, in the process. Um, because there's now a significant number of new variables. Um, some of you have mentioned Dr. Jeffrey Donner at uh, the University of Dalhousie. He has a contract with Tesla and has apparently come up with a whole new battery. And no, he didn't. He's got a contract with Tesla because the man has spent a lot of time and effort on test equipment that can rapidly um, test batteries, very highly automated test equipment that can rapidly test batteries for things like cycle life, round trip charge discharge efficiency, and of course capacity. Um, Maxwell introduced this new technology at the uh, Power Sources Conference in Denver last June. And uh, of course the acquisition has happened since then and I believe that they did have Dr. Danner take a look at this and do some tests on some pilot cells. And so Tesla's gotten to be pretty excited about the increase in performance in the cells and I don't know what they exhibit currently. And of course Elon wants to crank it up to 11 and run it in a ludicrous mode and make the dust fly, so to speak. What's this got to do with testing a Model 3 cell? Well, not a lot. Galileo Russell uh, at Hyperchange hyperventilated over the Maxwell thing. I mentioned him in my video. He did a follow-up video giving us a big shout out. And I uh, then made some comments on his follow-up video. And now we're kind of a mutual fan club um, and buddies on this thing. And, um, and so that's where that remains. Um, where was I going with all that? Um, there was a lot of interest in the Maxwell stuff and a lot of conjecture that was... Um, and not Galileo, a lot of his viewers and stuff, these are people interested in Tesla as an investment. The technical issues um, may be um, new to them, let's say. And so, um, there you are. By the way, all this information about Maxwell, I'm purely making up. And I could be the last guy left on the internet who could be wrong. We'll see how it turns out. Um... I kind of like it. So the issue is we're going to measure the capacity of the cell at what discharge rate. And we're going to get a different result based on the discharge rate we use. The Model 3 has a range of 310 miles. I can kind of tell you that at 70 miles an hour, you're not going to get that. Oddly, at 60, you probably will. And that's the uh, geometric increase in drag from air resistance with speed that causes that. Very cruel above 55 miles an hour for those of you who were around when we were trying to save gasoline uh, by driving 55, which can be terribly annoying. In any event, if you drive 70 miles an hour, you're only going to get about four hours in that car before you have to stop, pee, stop and pee if you're an old guy. And that would be a handy time to pull into a supercharger, get your car hooked up, and go take a pee. Because you're also going to be out of fuel. And so that's a four hour discharge rate, or a 0.25 C discharge rate. This is not what you do accelerating. It, when, of course, when you get done accelerating, you're coasting and putting energy back into the cell. 
So if I wanted to test a Tesla Model 3 5 amp hour cell in something akin to real world, world conditions, I would uh, probably pick a four hour discharge rate because that's what the battery will give me on the freeway at 70 miles an hour. Maybe a little more than four hours, but let's round it to four hours. And that gives us a 0.25 C discharge rate on a five amp hour battery. Looks like, sounds like, smells like 1.25 amps to me. Here's the problem. We got to sit here for four hours and write down the voltages every five minutes in order to get enough data points to make a nice curve. And um, that's uh, going to be it. Well, why don't I automate all that, Jack? Well, again, it's kind of a distrust. I have automated things in the past. And I either get halfway through the battery test or all the way through the battery test. And I notice some anomalies in the graph and the data. And when I go back and check, there's always something in the Arduino code or the measurement using an ADC or the connections or something that I botched up. So while you'd like to have more variables in battery design to optimize for things, in testing batteries, you'd like to have less variables. And so kind of a return to the very basics. Let's measure the current through a current shunt with a voltmeter and keep adjusting our little constant current device, which isn't quite as constant as you might think, for the correct current and do it slowly over four hours. And that should give us a pretty good representation for the capacity of the cell as you would drive it on a road trip. Now, if you wanna to go to the drag strip, you're gonna get a different result. But if you drove down the road at the normally legal, most widely legal speed limit in the U.S., 70 miles an hour, you're talking about four hours and a 0.25 C discharge rate, which looks like, sounds like, smells like to us, 1.25 amps discharge on a 5 amp hour uh, cell. So that's what we're going to do today. And this is our test setup. And uh, and so let's get started. Okay, we're starting at 4.1985 volts. That's uh, close enough to 4.2 for government work. And uh, we're going to adjust our uh, discharge rate now. And we're at one. We're at 13.1 millivolts. And uh, we're going to turn that down to uh, turn it up to 12.5 millivolts. That should be 1.25 amps. And that's going to give us our uh, uh, 0.25 um, C rate on a 5 amp um, device. And so our voltage starts down and we're at exactly 12.5 millivolts across our shunt. I've got 1.33 dialed in here and I can adjust that rate here. See there's 1, 1.27, 1.26, 1.25. I've got good control but this just doesn't read current very well. Again, automated uh, stuff. Uh, Jeffrey Dahmer's uh, had years of testing and development of his uh, automated test equipment, and that's what it takes to validate all that. So we're kind of running on the basics here. Uh, kind of a good quality 100 millivolt 10 amp shunt, 
and a pretty good Fluke 233 that will measure millivolts and of course four digits on our uh, uh, volts DC. And so we're going to uh, let that run for four hours. So um, Dan has suggested that we simply uh, video record the um, process of discharge uh, and then use the timeline in Final Cut Pro to get our precise five minute marks and um, and record the voltage shown on the display on the video. And so we have some new 400 gigabyte micro SD cards and can actually do that. Um, also, the little uh, constant current load was much uh, better than we had um, predicted at maintaining a constant current. We adjusted it a couple of times for a digit. Um, and so that's what we did. And here I have compressed that three hours and 35 minutes uh, to a one minute uh, display of the process uh, so you can see it. Okay, we're coming up on three volts and uh, we're at uh, three hours and 18 minutes at three volts. We have quite a bit less than five amps. Amp hour is going. Um, that's under the 1.25 volt load. And we're gonna let it go on down to uh, 2.8 volts and cut it off there. And then we will uh, revisit this and, and remove the load and see what our voltage uh, springs up to. But the classic way of doing this is to start at 4.2 and uh, drain it down under load uh, to three volts. But I do see some people measure to 2.8. And so we'll do that too. Our little uh, 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 constant current load is the stallion. The displays aren't real good, but the accuracy of the measured current displayed is not uh, very close. But we've been locked up at 12.5 millivolts across our shunt from the beginning and we've adjusted it once and it was for a digit. And so uh, this little uh, $24 constant current load is a stallion um, for maintaining a constant current. Um, I'm pretty impressed. This uh, load of 1.25 amps with 46 cells in the uh, brick uh, in the Model 3 is 57 and a half amps and that's just a few watts under 20 kilowatts. So you've got 190 kilowatt drive unit there or more with a four-wheel drive more yet with the uh, but this uh, is a, a total uh, at 70 miles an hour of uh, 20 kilowatts a uh, little less than that just a few watts um, at 57 and a half amps and a nominal pack voltage of 346.6 to go down the road at 70 miles an hour, and we've talked about this a Brazilian times. Our January 2015, um, we had two back-to-back -back videos describing this and how to calculate how much motor and power you would need to do a specific speed for a weight vehicle. Um, the Model 3 is uh, heavy-ish for a car at size. It, um, 3,900 pounds are very close to it. And, uh, and so you're using about 20 kilowatts of uh, power to do 70 mile an hour um, down the road for four hours. 
Um, and so that's uh, getting to be pretty close to an 80 kilowatt pack. I think it's 76 is what we've rated and calculated it at. Um, we have not gotten five amp hours at this point uh, by a good shot. We'll do the final calculations here at the end. We're going to run it down to 2.8 under load and call it a day. And we'll give you the <coughs> totals in amp hours um, and kilowatt hours at 3 and at 2.8 both. You can pick any value you want. And here we're coming up on 2.9 volts. As you can see, we're on the steep side of the discharge curve. And so it's moving pretty quickly at this point, um, coming on down. My, uh, we're coming right up on 2.8 um, volts. And we are almost right at three and a half hours. And I think a very reasonable um, 0.25C, um, one and a quarter. This is what you would actually probably be using in a Model 3 on a road trip. Um, and we're done right at um, three and a half hours. And that sort of indicates a uh, 4.375 amp hours, which I find quite disappointing. And if they've got a five amp hour cell, um, I would say that's uh, um, a bit disappointing. This, um, you're immediately gonna go to this came out of a used pack. Well, there aren't any Model 3s that used, and they, it does not lose capacity that quickly. Now we're bouncing up. Now that we've removed the load, and we're going to be well above 3 uh, volts here. So if you want to say 3 volts static, you might have a little bit more meat on that bone than 4.375 but it would be like 4.4 uh, and so my quick call is going to be 3.75 amp hours we're going to take a look at the video and do some calculations and we'll be back to uh, sum all this up we're slowing down a little bit now we may uh, actually slow down some by 3 volts that would be interesting. Not enough. It's going to rise a bit above 3 volts. But under load, we took it down to 3 and then to 2.8. Cut it off at 2.8 volts. <coughs> and uh, my best guess here, and again, this is kind of squishy. It depends on what you count and how you do the test. <coughs> If they've got five amp hours, they must have been doing it at 0.1C, and you're not going to get that on the road. So, figuring 70 miles an hour, a four-hour drive, you're not going to get 310 miles either at 70 miles an hour. So, I think that's a pretty good figure um, at uh, 70 miles an hour for... Uh, four hours and we didn't make it four hours um, about three and a half uh, give or take and uh, I'm going to call that done um, and it looks like about 3.375 to 4 amp hours um, or 4.375 4 to 4.4 amp hours on a Model 3 cell. I would be very surprised if there's much variation in cells, and I'd be very surprised if there's much variation between a brand new cell and one with 20,000 miles on it. And so uh, that's my uh, take on it. Again, as you can see, it's not precisely as uh, um, concise as science. 
Now, in automated equipment, you simply set a value, a cutoff. If they're going from 4.3 to 2.8 uh, at 0.1, um, they're being very generous to themselves on an amp hour measurement. Consider this a more uh, real world use of the battery uh, capacity analysis where we've tried to match it to uh, a real world scenario. Now driving around in town we can't do that very easily um, and so what we can do is assume the speed limit on c cruise control um, on varying terrain that's as much downhill as it is up and uh, and for about the range of the car. And um, it looks like um, you would get, uh, um, you know, about that. And we could reshoot that, assuming a four and a half amp hour, which would be a little bit less of a load, but it's not gonna come out a whole lot different. Um, so we'll do a little analysis of the video draw us up a uh, discharge curve and be back uh, for some further analysis. Stay with us. Damn. All righty. We're going to uh, summarize our discharge table here a little bit. First, um, I may have mentioned um, we uh, kind of got taken to task by Mr. Mark Lossier um, of Scarborough, Maine for reporting the uh, weight of the Model 3 cell um, at 70 grams and the uh, um, Model S cell at uh, 50 grams. And um, I have to tell you, I hadn't quite weighed them. Um, this is commonly traded on both in Panasonic's spec sheets and in uh, uh, much of the online lore. You have to be careful about carrying this information. Uh, I was typing myself smart. Um, he, uh, Mark is a uh, retired clinical pharmacist from Scarborough Coast, Maine. He uh, photographs eagles. Uh, let me put one of his photos up here. It's really quite remarkable. Um, we have farms here in Missouri and uh, farmers. And I asked him, how many farms do you have to have in Maine before you become a pharmacist? But he never did really answer that. He also noted that um, we had made some errors on the uh, volume of a um, cylinder, and he was quite correct in that. Um, let me see, I have it here, right here next to my heart, 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 heart. Uh, here it is somewhere. Hmm. Well, maybe not. I can get it here, I think. We had listed the volume of the Model 3 cylinder at uh, 930, I think, cubic centimeters. The uh, for, vo, vo, uh, formula for volume of a cylinder is, of course, um, pi r squared times the length. Uh, the Model 3 is 21 millimeters in diameter and 70 millimeters long, and that actually calculates out to, uh, let's see here, uh, 24,245 cubic uh, millimeters. Uh, the Model the Model S battery is 16,540. And what you'll find is that that's about a 46% increase in volume. Um, 
we did weigh the uh, cells. Uh, Mark had used a relatively inexpensive, he said, calibrated scale um, to do his calculations. They turned out to be quite accurate, actually. I bought a $169 scale to do them somewhat closer, and it didn't come out much different, but with some surprise. Okay, Mark Pelusier called us out on the uh, uh, weight of the Model 3 cell, and so I decided to take a look. I've got us a golden wall. Um, let's see here. Analytical electronic balance. Instead of being $8.79, this was um, right at um, $170 on Amazon. It'll do up to 5 kilograms and 0.01 gram resolution. We're going to put the Model 3 cell on here. And lo and behold, he's pretty close. He got 68.3 grams with the uh, $8.79 uh, cent version. And I'm seeing uh, settling in at about 68.17. So a little over 68 grams. That's uh, discussed as 70 grams. This is a Tesla Model 3. Uh, or Model S battery, and it purports to be 50 grams, I think. Might have been 45. I've got 46.87, so kind of splits the difference. And uh, so that's the actual results from the best uh, um, electronic balance I could uh, quickly locate. So that's your lesson of the day of how to use a scale. Uh, we wound up with uh, 68.2 grams on the Model 3 and a surprising 46.95, call it 47 grams, on the 50 gram um, Model S 18650. The, uh, in other news, just as this is a good place to interject it, we found three uh, more batteries in our little pack, except they don't have any gasket on them, and they're not a battery at all. And they do have quite a nipple, which I think would be handy on the other ones, uh, but what this appears to be is some sort of structural spacer along the uh, end where the manifold is for the cooling and I assume to give it strength, if anybody knows any different, I'd love to hear what that's about. We did uh, finish our um, discharge of the Model 3 cell, and I actually used the video. We took four hours of video. I didn't really want to sit here and write down those voltages every five minutes, so I took the video and used that to find the five minute marks and the uh, voltage and made a spreadsheet. I'll put up the graph here so you all can follow along with me. Um, and the result was 214 minutes on the discharge at 2.8 volts and that totaled a 4.458 amp hours of uh, capacity. And in fact that was uh, Let's see what did the watt hours. Uh, watt hours I actually calculated um, at each. We were at a steady um, 1.25 amps, but the voltage, of course, changed across the curve. So I actually did the uh, uh, kilowatt hours every five minutes and sort of summed them. And uh, that's a, probably the most accurate way to do it. 16.184. Uh, watt hours per cell and um, so that's uh, interesting if you take three amp hours for the 18650 and again that's kind of a wag but we do a lot of 18650 testing um, 
not of the individual cells, but of the modules. I think about three is about right. And uh, 4.458 uh, amp hours for the Model 3 cell. And the it, I can't find any sign of magic here. Um, you have 46% increase in volume, and I'm measuring about 45% increase in uh, capacity. So there does not appear to be any great advances in uh, chemistry as far as energy density. It's strictly a function of the volume of the cell increasing um, and the weight of the cell increasing. If you take the 47 and the 68, you come up with very similar numbers. So this is pretty simple. It's a bigger cell um, and it has more energy. Um, the distance between the cells is, I would say, a little bit bigger in the Model 3 pack, but not that much. And so in the geometry of these things, you probably have more wasted space in the um, Model S battery than you do in the Model 3. It simply lost the spaces in the, uh, between the cells. The uh, not really much surprise in the discharge curve. All right, I'll show you the uh, discharge curve for the Model S uh, and the Model 3 side by side. And you can see they're pretty close. Um, I would say some of the hook on the end of the uh, uh, going vertical on the uh, Model S, it's a little flattened out for the Model 3. Um, the jump from 4.2 down to f about 4 volts, it's mostly surface charge, um, but it is pretty vertical at that point. And the, uh, so that's the discharge curve for the Model 3 battery. Kind of surprising, 4.458 amp hours. I had guessed 4.8. Um, and people were saying five to six. Uh, that just doesn't appear to be the case. And our calculations show at the 4.58, you've got about um, 305 amp hours in a 46 cell brick, and um, or 205 amp hours, I'm sorry. Uh, in a 46-cell um, Model 3 brick, uh, and about 71,469 watt-hours in the battery, and that all sounds pretty good to me. Um, again, doing lab spec for advertising, uh, they were undoubtedly doing that at 0.1C, it doesn't account for this much difference, uh, but some. And we were attempting at 1.25 amps to do a 0.25 C discharge, more representative of you going from fully charged to pretty much fully discharged at 70 miles an hour on a freeway. So a little more real world thing. Um, the time that we wound up with was 214 minutes and that corresponds pretty much to about a 250 mile range at 70 miles an hour and my experience with a car would be kind of dead nuts on that uh, we don't get 310 miles at two at 70 miles an hour but you'd be surprised at 60 or 65 you kind of can and so if I nail it up at 60 and drive from St. Louis down to here, which is a little bit of a uh, um, decrease in elevation, uh, I'll get home with uh, 55 miles or so of uh, range left. And that would be at basically 100 and 175 mile range or 275 mile range. Um, so that's uh, uh, 
pretty much the situation. Um, we're, uh, it's surprising, but not very, at 4.458. I guess I had been secretly hoping for something astonishing. This was not. It was pretty normal. We're going to talk a little bit now about supercharging. I've seen some ridiculous comments here recently. One guy tried to explain to me that the reason you charge faster for the first 50% of your supercharge experience than the second 50% took longer was because of the temperature of the batteries, that there was a heat problem with the batteries. There is no heat problem with the batteries. It's very rare for the system to even cool the batteries. Uh, it's more common to heat them. Um, if you're doing high performance racing and so forth, a lot of strong accelerations, you will pick up some heat and they do have the stuff to take care of it. And heating and cooling, particularly when you have a liquid system, as their very highly engineered and excellent system is, it's just not a problem. Um, so we'll demonstrate that a little bit here in a minute. Um, the record holder for a uh, Tesla supercharge right now is right at 124, 125 kilowatts. At, uh, let's pull up the magic calculator here. If I can find it. If we, uh, your nominal voltage is 3.6 volts, that shows up in this graph as well. That's the point at where you're at 50% charge. It's a little over 3.6 volts. That's uh, 345 volts for the pack. If we take 125,000 watts, and we divide that by 346, we get 361 amps. Now, there's some discussion about Porsches and so forth being able to charge at 350 kilowatts. And the question is, will the Model 3 batteries do that? Probably not. I mean, they will, but it could be pretty rough on them. What you have to understand is that the way they do 350 kilowatts is with an 800 volt pack. And that causes a lot of issues with DC to DC converters, contactors, arcing, um, the uh, uh, charger, uh, everything. It's more expensive and is harder to find, harder to source. Um, I'm not a real safety Nazi. I get bit by 350 volts DC all the time, and uh, it's not something I seek, but it's not a medical event. 800 volts, I'm not sure I want to be around 800 volts. It's just uh, too much volts. But the reason they get away with it is that 800 volts, uh, you have half the current. If we were charging um, at uh, the same 124, 125 kilowatts at 800 volts, you'd be looking at 180 amperes. And where this shows up is not actually the batteries. It's the cable from the supercharger to the car and the connector between the supercharger and the car and then the cable from that charge port to the batteries and the contacts into the batteries. The batteries themselves, it's not much of a problem. You have 46 of them in parallel and 361 amps uh, divided by 46. And this is kind of important, is 7.85 amperes. So if we charge this cell at 7.85 amps, um, that is uh, all you can do at a current Tesla supercharger. Anyway, into a cell. They're 
plated with plates in parallel. And that brick will act as one battery um, with all of them in parallel. Uh, so to do 360 amps, 46 of them in parallel is 7.85 amperes. And that's uh, what's going to form the basis of our test today for charging. Um, as to the disparity in charge rate from the beginning to the end of the charge, let me uh, introduce uh, some of you and bore the hell out of a bunch of other longtime viewers that lithium batteries are typically charged on what's called the constant current, constant voltage charge cycle. And the way this works is you charge at all the current you can make until the battery reaches a target voltage, in this case 4.2 volts. And at that point, you go into constant voltage. And your equipment is set up to do this, your charger. And it will hold it at 4.2 volts. Now, as the energy or state of charge level of the battery comes up, it requires less current to maintain that. And so as the voltage of the battery tries to rise above 4.2 volts, let's say you go to 4.25, we just crank the current down a little bit and bring it right back down to 4.2. And it'll rise again to 4.25, and we'll crank it down again. And you continue doing that. Classically, most batteries, you continue to do that to C divided by 20, or 5% capacity. Um, and at that current level, you just cut it off. Now, I want you to understand something that's kind of important and often overlooked. I can bring that battery to 4.2 volts in a couple of seconds with enough current. Or I can take an hour to get it to 4.2 volts using a much lower level of current. And so my charge rate moves and determines the switchover point from CC to CV. At a higher charge current, you're going to get to your target voltage much faster and then go into constant voltage. And at a low charge rate, let's say 20 amps or so into the battery, you'll pretty much be toward the end of the charge before it switches over. And at the charge rates we do, here I've got a PowerSafe 100 with a 100 kilowatt, ha a kilowatt hour pack, and we're charging at 5 kilowatts or something. By the time we get to the, the switch point of constant current to constant voltage, I don't care. <coughs> I don't even bother with the constant voltage part. When we get that voltage, we just cut it off. You're done. But that's because of the ratio of our solar storage to our ability to charge it. And so we can get away with that pretty easily. And of course, we're erring on the side of undercharging it. Sue me. That's just going to protect my batteries a little bit more. And so the, uh, but it's important to note that that point moves around. The second factor is we can control that point. We can say that we're going to go into constant voltage at 4.1 volts and then still when we get down to a certain level of current go ahead and let it rise to 4.2 and I believe Tesla actually does that in software. And it doesn't make that much difference, but it again moves it a little further back uh, down the state of charge level where the switchover occurs. And so that's why if you pull into a supercharger, you can get 70 or 80% battery full quite quickly. And to go from 80 to 100 takes as long 
as it took to get to 80. From zero to 80, let's say, is 30 minutes. To go from 80 to 100 is another 30 minutes. And it's because of this tapering charge that we use while maintaining the voltage. And you're going to see that here in a minute. Um, so let's take a look at our setup. We're at 2.9957 volts DC. I know that's not exactly 3 volts. Give me a break here, guys. Close enough for government work, all right? And we have our little handy-dandy power supply here. I'm going to switch on our millivolt meter on the millivolt scale and change it from AC millivolts to DC millivolts. Let's see if we can get my telephone operational and uh, get that done. And here's my stopwatch. And we're going to start that watch and turn on our power supply, which is currently charging at 10.3 amps. And I've got 102.5 shown there. And I'm going to try to dial that down to 10 amps, which as I say is more than 2C and more than a supercharger can put out. What did I say? 8 7.85 amps would be as much as the current supercharger can do. But we're going to charge at 10 amps and we're going to do that until we get to 4.2 volts. And I've got my clock working here, and we'll see how long it takes it to get to 4.2 volts. And um, we'll play Jeopardy music or something in the background until then. Um, yeah, we're at 3.91 now from 3 volts. If I shut this off, we're going to dive all the way back down to like 3.1 or something. I'm going to leave it going uh, because of our clockage here. And uh, let's see what I have to do to get it back to 10. And I'm actually adjusting voltage here. And you'll see why this is an issue here in a little bit. So we're back up to 3.90. I'm a minute 38 in it. And uh, away we go on our supercharged test of the Model 3 2170 uh, battery. By the way, why don't we just take our temperature, find out what bad news we got here. I'm at 18.5 is the highest temperature I can get with my little IR gun. So let's write that down. 18.5 centigrade is more or less our starting temperature and we've hit 3.91 and we're kind of stalled out there so we're away we're going here and one of the things that we might as well talk about since I'm stalled out we'll keep an eye on this uh, is diffusion the lithium ions, as I've said several times, do not become covalent with anything. There's no chemical change in any of the materials. Instead, it intercalates in between um, two layers of, in the cathode case, um, when charging. Uh, well, when charging, we're intercalating into the... Uh, um, uh, anode. We're taking electrons off of the cathode and losing their field effect which will release a positively charged lithium ion into the electrolyte raising the charge of the entire electrolyte which causes a lithium ion next to the anode to then seek escape. And the electron we took off of the cathode, we bring around and put on the anode, the can side of the uh, device. And that raises 
the negative field charge of the uh, carbon uh, anode. And the attraction of these charges, a slightly increased uh, level of positive charge on the electrolyte, and a minor increase in the negative charge of the anode causes one of the lithium ions to intercalate in between the octahedral um, layers of octahedral crystal of the graphite. Now here's what I want you to understand. The lithium ion doesn't even touch the graphite. Both the upper layer and the lower layer of the space it finds are equally negative. And the lithium ion is positive. And so it entraps in the center of that octahedral shape and it entraps dead middle between the two layers. And it's held there by the charge and it neutralizes the electric charge of the cat, uh, anode with the positive charge of the ion. And so our anode could then accept another electron and our uh, cathode could be, uh, have a uh, uh, oxidation of the cathode, a release of the electron and a redux uh, of the uh, uh, anode with the uh, uh, addition of an electron. And when that happens, another lithium ion intercalates. So what is diffusion? Well, the lithium ion is going to take the first available space. And the next lithium ion will take one next to it. And this will continue until all the surface spaces are gone. Now, at that point, uh, a, another lithium ion wants in, and what it does is displace one of the existing lithium ions. Now, you would think it would jump to the next um, space. It actually hops to, I don't know why, but it hops two spaces and leaving that one open, which can accept that lithium ion. Now, the analogy I've used successfully in the past is of a nightclub. If you go in at 5.30 after work, you can walk right in the nightclub, walk right up to the bar, order a beer, bartender's glad to see you, somebody to talk to. No problem. Try that at 9.30 when the meat market opens. Now the place has kind of got a lot of people. When you come in, they kind of jostle around to make room for you. Try that at 10, 30, or 11, when people have got to pair up if they want any tonight. And if you go in the door, everybody in the bar has got to move six inches to make room for you. And there's a guy coming in behind you. Better yet, six-foot-tall blonde chick with hooters. However you do it, Everybody's got to move to make accommodation. So as these lithium ions intercalate into this crystalline structure, more and more of the existing um, lithium ions get jostled around and have to reposition for space. And I said that it jumped too. Well, now we got to start packing them in a little tighter. And they're forced to be in the next space instead of two over. And this continues until the anode is full and then you're fully charged. And so you see, we put in a bunch of uh, electrons at 10 amps and the voltage came up pretty quickly. But now we're starting to have diffusion. And this is like a resistance. This then is the limiting factor to uh, fast charging, but it's also, and more importantly probably, it all works in reverse on discharging. And so to make a lot of current quickly, you have to control 
the diffusion. A123, a number of years ago, came up, this came out of MIT with a new um, incremental advance in lithium iron phosphate chemistry, and they came up with a very finely ground, um, much smaller particle size for the active materials. The addition of a carbon, um, a very fine graphite additive to the cathode side, um, and they used a process to make an extremely thin layer of material on the uh, cathode. This let them do 20C discharges. These batteries might be good for 3C. But the A123 batteries would routinely do 20C, having this very thin thing. So I have described for you um, at length and ad nauseum that um, pull a Kanye West there, give you all my code to my phone, I'll be okay. The, uh, uh, the trade-off between energy capacity or energy density using a thicker cathode material and power density, the ability to make a lot of current by making a thin cathode material. And so this is about controlling the resistance to diffusion. That's what all that's about. We want a great big nightclub with a lot of doors, but you can't go in very far <laughs> till you hit the bar. So with all these doors, we can go in faster, but not, not as many of us can go in at all. And so that's uh, the nightclub analogy. We're at four volts, 11 minutes uh, at 10 amperes. Um, now, if we would simply do our 4.458, um, the, uh, let's see, let's do 4.458 divided by 10 is 44.58% uh, of an hour um, times 60 should be 26 minutes. We're at 11.52 here. And we should be able to charge it 26 point and three quarters minutes. Uh, 26 minutes and 45 seconds. Um, but we're at 4.03 now. Still holding uh, nine .9 amps pretty carefully. Let's see if I can tune that just by one digit. There we go. On our shunt, we're at 100. Uh, and we're still at 10 amps on the power supply, 12 minutes, and we're uh, at 4.04 uh, volts and climbing. So let's see how this comes out. And so a lot of this has to do with diff diffusion, and it's um, interesting, if not important, uh, to note that the lithium ions are suspended between um, these crystalline layers. Now on the uh, cathode side, it kind of depends on your chemistry, but in LiPo4 cells, it's a much more complex tetrahedral crystal. And uh, so what, uh, what's going on there? Well, it makes, that's why the diffusion in the power production in the cathode becomes so important. A more complex uh, crystalline structure for the lithium ions to tunnel into to balance out the charge of the electrons on the uh, um, aluminum foil. Now understand too 
the reason we use lithium is it has three protons, three neutrons, and three electrons. And the two electrons are on the innermost valence band. We say that the one is on a, a, the next valence band, or the outermost valence band. <coughs> it actually kind of skips a valence band. We don't know exactly why. But it makes that one electron I'm not very seriously attached to that lithium ion. You can pull it out. So you have a lithium hydroxide in the cathode when you build the battery. The first time you charge it is called forming it. The battery goes to formation and it's very slowly charged. And at that point, the, uh, the electrons are, um, yes, dear, please go away. I'm in the middle of something here, I'm my queen. Um, where was I? After the battery's formed, the electrons are there they don't really need to rejoin with the lithium ion. Some of them actually will, but that's not the point. When the electron gets around on the current collector and it changes the field of that cathode, we can balance that out with a lithium ion anywhere in the cathode. They don't actually, it doesn't really have to recapture the electron. And so the, the lithium atoms never get their electrons back, really. They simply move back and forth uh, following the charge of the electrons. Please, dear. We're at 16 minutes and 4.15 volts. And coming up on it. 4.16. Maxwell has come out with a dry process for the um, batteries. And they've gotten some remarkable gains in the uh, performance of the batteries. And I'm going to bet you 100 bucks right now they're not sure why. They were working on the mechanical process to make the batteries, and when they tested the batteries, and it doesn't matter what chemistry, by the way, which is a clue, lithium iron phosphate, NCA, NCM, they all get the same performance increase. The uh, reason for it, I believe, is the polymer. See, when you have the liquid slurry made out, up out of this uh, NMP solvent and a, a polymer, to act as a binder to hold all this onto the foil. It um, is not terribly conductive. Um, and it's, uh, it's not really an insulator, uh, it's something in between. But as a liquid, it fills the interstitial spaces between the granules of the sharp crystal granules of this um, um, cathode material. 4.20. Let's see what we can do. And climbing. We're at 17, almost 18 minutes here. I want to start adjusting our voltage down. And whoa, right there, we changed over to constant voltage. And I can crank that back up. Still at constant voltage to 10 amps, pretty much. And we're still climbing. So I'm going to turn down that voltage a little bit. Okay, there we drop some. And so we're slowing down. I'm going to turn that down a little bit more. This power supply is not great at doing this. So let's turn this down some more.
and there I'm at seven amps, and my voltage is falling that back down. As you see, we're falling down to 4.167 and counting down. Well, we got to 4.1668, and now we go up to 69 and 70 and 72, and now it's starting to go back up. And our voltage is going up, and we're at 6.92 amps, but there we drop to 6.86. And we're still going up over here. We're at 69596. But our current is holding pretty steady. And so we'll keep an eye out on that. Where were we when we crossed over? 17 minutes? And our temperature now is up substantially. But the highest reading I can get is 23.5. We still have a degree and a half to go before we get to spec temperature, 25C, which is about 75 degrees Fahrenheit on the battery. Do we have a temperature problem going on here? We're almost about to get comfortable, get out of the chill, and so away we go. We're at 6.67 amps and 4.19 and counting up on voltage, and I kind of have to help my little constant current constant voltage supply here to uh, do this. So we're coming up on 4.2, but we're down to 6.59. It's starting to drop now a little bit. And we can get it pretty close. We're up over 4.2. Let me give it a little nudge. There's 6.39. Still climbing. And I'm adjusting the voltage here, guys, not the uh, current. But it has the effect of dropping the current. Well, now we're down below, but still climbing. 5.84. So it's not keeping up again. We're still climbing. Let me give it a little nudge on the voltage. It's working, but let me get below 4.2. So you can see this actually happen. 4.1938, kind of holding at five amps. Now four, four, one, four, two, four, three, four, four. We're charging at five amps. Let's turn this back on. Four point nine eight amps, really. Four point nine seven. And we're coming up again on four point two volts. Four 0.96. See, the power supply is dropping the current, but it's just not quite keeping up. So let's turn down the voltage a little bit. Check our time. We're at 23.28. We've crossed over at 17. Let me turn down our voltage just a little bit. Well, I've turned it too far.
There we go, 4.185 and still climbing. We're down to 3.89 amperes, 24 minutes. Three point eight six amps, and we're starting to climb back up. This climb of the voltages is we add energy into the cell. Now we're not adding it at ten amps anymore. More a little under four, <coughs> but our increase will accelerate <coughs> even as our current is dropping as the state of charge of the battery climbs and we get to more of the sharp end of the curve, my little power supply isn't smart enough to do all this. So I keep having to nudge it. Crank that up. So I gave that a big nudge there. We're down to 2.82 amps and we're at 4.1807 and climbing slowly because I gave it kind of a big bump down in current. So as you can see, the battery's charging faster because it's on the steep side of the curve, but our current's falling off too and that takes longer to fill the battery. So we're at 25 minutes and uh, we switched over at 17 to constant voltage. I'm kind of manually helping the constant voltage here a little bit, but that's the idea. And we're at 4.1849. I don't remember where I was at on my, dis oh, the interstitial spaces are filled by this not very conductive polymer. On the dry process, it works a little differently. We're mixing in beads, little microgranules of polymer, and it's not liquid. It's just mixed into the mixture. Now, if we run through that, that through a hot roller, neither that heat nor the pressure of the roller are going to do anything to those sharp little crystalline um, powder granules. But the polymer is soft and it softens in the presence of heat. And so it's going to flatten out um, and spread out and come in contact with more uh, granules and it's hot and soft. And the sharp edges of the crystalline structure are going to become embedded in that polymer. And when we come off that roller, it's going to make kind of a mat. But the mat is not airtight. It's little granules of polymer smashed like pancakes in different places. And so all the interstitial spaces are not filled as they would be with a liquid. And there's lots of places lithium ions could go in all to the current collector almost and have different edges to come in on into the crystalline structure of the active material. It's like putting a whole lot more doors on our nightclub. The nightclub is the same size. There's just as many people in it, but you have a whole lot more places to go in the door. And so um, it's a little less. If you're coming in the front door and the main reason you're going to the nightclub is because you got to pee and the restroom's in the back, you got a long way to go, and there's a lot of jostling going to happen before you ever get relief. But if you go in the door, it's right next to the restroom. It's not quite so bad. So by not completely filling the interstitial spaces between the um, uh, powder granules of crystalline, um, we leave tunnels that we can go through with our lithium ion. And the size of these tunnels compared to a uh, lithium ion would be sort of like rolling a bowling ball down the Holland Tunnel. 
the tunnels, the interstitial spaces, <coughs> are huge compared to the size of the lithium atoms, the cation, the, the ions, the positive ions. Got to crank it down some more. Let's go to one point. Oh, we're back below four point two, and we're at uh, one point nine two amperes. We're also again. I've lost my clock here. At twenty nine minutes. Well, we uh, we switched over at seventeen. Um, we're at twelve minutes. Uh, on the part after reaching 4.2 volts. And we're charging at a much lower rate of 2 amps than 10 amps. So you see how the time on the second part of your charge becomes decreasingly productive. With 310 mile range and the supercharger is 150 miles apart, why do you want to fill it to the brim? Um, 20 or 30 minutes, you've got the good out of the supercharging experience and you're probably got enough to get to the next supercharger station anyway. Um, what's our temperature? Well, what happened? At a lower current rate, we're down to 20 C. We went from 18.5 C to 23.5 C to 20 C. Well, our current's dropped. So it isn't because the batteries got overheated that we have to uh, drop the uh, current and slow down the process. It's, it's actually the opposite. By the time we get stopped, we'll be back down around 18 and a half or 19 C because we're putting less current in there. Then I like this now, we're slowly coming up on 4.2, and uh, but we're at 31 minutes now. And um, so we started at over 2C, 10 amps. times 46 is 460 amps times 345 volts is 158 kilowatts so we've just demonstrated a Tesla Model 3 cell under the duress of supercharging not at 125 kilowatts it's available but at 158.7 uh, kilowatts. And what is Elon talking about for V3? I think you'll find it's about 160 kilowatts. Nothing has to happen to the batteries. They can do it just fine. Right now, the way they are in the car. But 450 amps, guys. The I squared R losses in that cable from the supercharger and through the cable, which is bigger and can carry more current in the Model 3 than it can in the Model S, um, it's all part of God's plan. That's where the problems are, not in the batteries, in the cabling to the batteries. It's a lot of current. It's more current than I want to do. 4.2 volts. Climbing slowly, let me bump it down just a hair. We may actually get it into a range where this uh, power supply can work. I guess not. And so we're at 33 minutes. Wait a minute, we changed to constant voltage at 17. We're a minute away from doing the constant current, constant voltage switchover at 
of our time. Now I can tell you that if we drop that to our 1.25 amps that we discharged at, that we will be 90% um, done when we hit 4.2 volts. And if we drop it further to the 0.1 C or 0.4458 amps to do our charge, that you, you don't have to do the constant voltage at all. So that's the dynamic going on there in supercharging. You can move that CCCV point around, but it, it keeps going back earlier in the charge the higher you charge it at, the higher the rate. Um, and so there you go. 4.2026. Let's uh, crank her down just a little bit. Turn her down to 4.195, and I'm at 1.48 amps. And my phone keeps going off on me. So here I am at 1.49 amps, 35 minutes. Our CCCV point was at half our time. And so it wasn't at half our state of charge. It was half of our charging time. And you, you're not going to know about your state of charge too much. At the supercharger, you're going to know how long you were hooked up there. And we were mostly done at uh, 17 minutes. And we've been here another 17 minutes to get not very much additional. And so at high rates of... Uh, charge, you can get 50% <coughs> stated charge in 20 minutes. And by 30 minutes, you're up get pushing the hell out of 80%. And you want to go to 100%? That's the other half hour. So you can spend an hour charging there, but you only get 20% stated charge for your second half hour. That's what I wanted to address with you about constant current, constant voltage charging and high current rates. And we have been at a very high current rate of 158 kilowatts on a Model 3. Not 124, 158, 159 for all practical purposes, 158.7 kilowatts. And no temperature problem at all. We're at, as I said, it's continuing to drop. Well, I can get a 20C here. I can still get a 20C temperature. And that's what it read the last time. So, and we're just barely crawling up at uh, 1.45 amps. But we're continuing to charge, and we will continue. It's just we're not adding very much to the battery. So that's kind of the story on supercharging of the Model 3. We've done an uh, actual discharge at a... Uh, so our supercharging is at realistic, um, even high uh, current levels for your Model 3 car, up to 158 kilowatts. Um, and our discharge was done not at a um, let's advertise a spec for our battery rate, but at a rate where you would consider, you would be able to relate this to operation of the car. 70 miles an hour, three and a half hours, three hours and 35 minutes. Um, three hours and 34 minutes, I guess it was. Um, and that's something you can understand, relate to, and see doing in the car. And what you're going to get is less than 4.5 amp hours. Um, not much less, but a little less. 
uh, and you have a 205 amp hour um, capacity on the whole pack and that works out to be a usable Rio 71 kilowatts. Now could I do this to 4.3 volts? Uh, duh, yeah. <laughs> uh, what are we doing there? We're, we're up at the top edge of the, ba the fully charged battery. And, um, and we like to be a little below that. Could I discharge it to 2.8 amp static? 2.8 uh, volt static? Uh, yeah. So do you want to say you have a 75 or 76 kilowatt battery? No, you don't. <laughs> Stick with a 71. You don't have to get the last quarter in the grass, <laughs> and uh, uh, and you'll you'll do a little better. You won't do a lot better. Don't get carried away with this, but slightly undercharging, and doing most of your charging at home to eighty percent is good medicine. It does not do what the guys in the Tesla Motor Club would have you believe, but it is good medicine. And we would adhere to that. I'm at 4.20. We're at 40 minutes, 1.32 amps. Does any of this sound familiar to you all? 40 minute full charge. So 17 minutes, you're halfway there. And at 40, you're fully charged. Do it to the degree you want. But we've demonstrated really a quite realistic supercharging scenario on a single cell that is directly, it's not an analogy it's what's happening in your car 46 times, 46x. And those bricks, understand this is not a random event. When you put conductors on the top and bottom, it becomes one battery cell. Just like our lithium iron phosphates are 400 pages. You can think of those as 400 individual cells, but they're all in parallel. It's one battery. And so you have a... Uh, 205 amp hour uh, cell at 3.6 volts and you have 96 of them. And all that mathematics works out perfectly to the, the universal Church of Rome, the Holy Roman Empire. It's in complete concert with the Pope, the papacy. And so there you go. I'm going to shut this off, guys. And... Uh, call it at 42 minutes and uh, there you have it and there it is and there is our uh, discharge and our charge and our true weights and our true volumes what have I left out let's see if James and Danu can show you guys how to hook up a uh, version 2 um, controller for the Model S Modules. Hello, my name is Dara Judisilva. I'm the lead technician here at EVTV. My name is James Gresh. I'm a technician here at EVTV. And together we are going to talk about how to set up your V2 that you have just purchased or already purchased. And so here we have the V2 and let's dive right in. So starting off, we have the on off switch here and we have the red for the positive contactor and here for the green for the negative contactor. Or did I switch that out, James? Yeah, you did. I did. <laughs> so, the red for the negative contactor and green for the positive contactor. That was a test to see if James mm. knew it. Good catch, James. Always testing me. All right. So, to find the input side of the V2, we have a current sense on this side, and we have a BMS wire that you can see. And with that, you can identify that these two wires on this side are for the input. And you can say with the red 
heat shrink is for the positive and the black heat shrink is for the negative. Got my wires tangled up yeah. there, didn't I? And then on to the output side, we have the red heat shrink for the positive and the black heat shrink for the negative. And then next, let's go on to the ports. Again. Yep. And on this side, we have a 12 volt input that can also be used as an output. And this we can use to power other devices that use 12 volts or if you're using a setup that goes over 48 volts, you can use that to use it uh, to put input 12 volts to power this system. And then on this side, we have a USB port, which you can use to communicate to your computer or your laptop. And you can use that to do the initial setup, and we'll explain a little bit more about that in the following video. And on this side, you have the CAN port, which you can connect a TCCH charger or any other device that you want. And onto the back, we have two ports here, which is the heat enable on this side and the charge enable on this side. And for an example of what we use, the charge enable, we use it for, again, the TCCH charger or other chargers that we might plug in there. And also we use it for the frequency shift for our power safe. And that's about all the ports we have on this. And James, you want to explain about the display? When you buy the V2, it also comes with a box that comes with our display, our 5-volt <laughs> plug-in. Uh, Richard likes to call this Nerd Candy, so it's a little <laughs> keyboard to help you configure well, let's see if I can get it out of here, Danny. Configure the uh, Wi-Fi. <laughs> Big finger. Configure the Wi-Fi on the display. Also comes with an HDMI cord. So when you uh, get the display, get the plug-in, plugs into the back here. Let's see if I can get these it's big fingers volt, in here. Right? Yep, 5 volt. Micro USB. Do, 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 do. Ah, plugs right in there, and that plugs into your wall. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, you can set this anywhere you want. Like uh, Jack has said in many videos, you can put it wherever you want in the kitchen. Um, it's wireless. And, and that's the can, biggest yep. uh, question we have is how to connect this to this on your own Wi-Fi. Because when you get it, it's connected or it has the specifications of EV configurations TV. for EVTV here. And if you don't live down the street, it won't <laughs> be able to work. So in another video, we're going to go a little more in depth in that. Um, Daniel and I are going to talk a little bit about that. So. Yep. I think that covers the V2 for this part. So, James, you want to explain the batteries with Richard? Yeah, we'd love right. to. Let's move on to that. Here with EVTV, and if you call into the shop, I'm usually the one that answers the phone and takes some of the calls about the Tesla battery module. Now, today, James and I are going to talk about the simple setup of what is a 10 kilowatt system and explain uh, the arrangement, show you what you're dealing with. Now with the Tesla module, these are car batteries. They come out of a great need for energy density. But if you look at this arrangement, the size of it is very compact. It makes it very useful in the RVs and the, the boats. And uh, if you have area where storage concerns uh, uh, are something that you want to factor into your decision makings, these are a very good dense battery. Now, um, this arrangement here is uh, a, a series unit, which is a 48 volt. And then over here, we have a parallel, which is a 24 volt setup. Those are the two most popular sizes that I hear people call in for. Uh, we also have a complete plethora of all the connective devices that you need to make your system operational and go right over to our control unit. Now, James, do you mind showing some of the things that you work with, explain how you put these parts on, and you know, give them a little rundown of course, on Richard, the yeah. assembly side? Yeah, we can do that. So like Richard said, this is a parallel, batteries in parallel. As you can see from the front here, it uses our stacking strap, which is copper, with a little bit of heat shrink on it. It goes negative to negative, and there's another one on this side, which goes positive to positive. And for that, we just use a nut driver to tighten the top one, a uh, half nut driver, and then a closed wrench, insulated, for the inside. Make sure those connections are tight, because that's usually where we have our problems. Normally in the shop is a loose connection at either one of these points. And then to get the communication from the printed circuit board inside the Tesla battery, we use our two-module harness for these, for these two in parallel, 
and we connect that into our V2, as you saw from Danny's video. Well, that, that is a very important point about the harness. We do use the Tesla board that is assembled. We use the same brains that Tesla is already using in the battery module. Uh, these are powerful energy devices. Uh, safety concerns, controlling the charge and the discharge are very critical. And I do get calls from time to time from people that want to hodgepodge systems and put a $14.99 battery monitor system on, on, a, on a very powerful battery. We use a full battery controller that interacts with the, 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 the brains that are already installed by Tesla. And we have the harnesses and everything you need to do with that. What like else? Richard was saying, um, we get a lot of calls about different different subjects. One is we had a person call who just had one battery and their two module harness wouldn't work. So we have a shorting plug that plugs into the one of the sides you're not <laughs> using. Usually the I think it's the closest one to the to this connection here. And it it's the farthest one from the connection. That's my mistake. It's the farthest from the connection. And that usually that shorts it out so that way you can read one battery <laughs> to the end. You so could. here, I guess we could. There you go. So my mistake was plugs farthest away. And then you can plug, plug that, that into, into your the, controller. Yep, test mm -hmm. the battery controller. We have the controller in a couple different versions. We have the fully assembled, the V2. We also have a basic kit that mm -hmm. requires you to assemble. Uh, if you have intermediate electronic skills, uh, you can probably handle that. But again, I would say intermediate. So it is not uh, a beginner item if you're not really used to electronics. You know, it, you'd have to find somebody who was to get it assembled. But these are uh, uh, that's a pretty substantial amount of energy here when you think about 10 kilowatts in something that is, is just this size. So uh, we, we get a lot of calls for the twos, and we get a lot of calls for the fours. We have additional harnessing, and you can actually add more and more battery uh, packs as you can grow the system once you, once you start it. So that's kind of a, a nice flexibility part of the, the package that we have. But all these items, items are available in the store. You can get online. Uh, we can normally ship them to you within a few days. Hey Richard, how are those two connected? These two are with the braided battery straps, one of our signature items here at, at um, EVTV. EVTV. And it has a couple advantages, James, which I don't know you're aware of where this came from. Originally, in the car batteries, they used the, the, the full uh, uh, solid battery straps. Mm -hmm. And over time, the, vi the road vibration and the wear and tear of the battery moving up and down was continuously loosening the battery straps. And that's a very critical point. And these are flexible. So if you're in a boat or if you're in an RV and your battery system is moving a little bit, your straps have some leeway. leeway to them. So that is a good point. And that is something that we have that is unique and proprietary here to EVTV because we have so much experience really dealing with battery connections. And as we say, it's all about the battery. Mm -hmm. What else do we say around here, James? Polarity matters. Polarity matters. So you have to know your positive and negatives for your series in parallel, and that's how you stay safe. But we've got stuff here. We've got James on board just waiting <laughs> to pack up your order. So uh, if you need some of these items, uh, we can get them to you. And we have done quite a few of these now, and they are operatingly very well in the field. So give us a call here at EVT. So that was a good demonstration with uh, Richard and James showing how to set up the batteries. So now we're going to show how to connect the V2 to the batteries. And James here is going to show us what to do first. <laughs> All right. So you take the negative side. Mm -hmm. And we have, what is this, Daniel? What do we have here on top of the current sensor? That is a custom-made uh, copper inch and a half bar that we cut so it fits perfectly on a Tesla battery module. So if you look, um, there we have a hole that is a 516 that is perfectly made for an M8 bolt, which is what usually uh, Tesla battery modules come with. And that is perfectly lined up with the current sensor with uh, as much surface area as we can. So we have very little I2R losses there. 
James is going to tight it as much as he can, right? <laughs> Got to make it a good connection. Yep. This is where we usually have the most problems in our wiring. Usually when it starts to heat up, if there's any uh, problems in between the connection, they start to heat up. And then from there, it just gets worse and worse. So you want to fix that problem before it even starts. And that's why we make our connections as tight as possible. Do you this not have enough kind of interesting. Here. Now we can move it around here. There you go, James. Thanks, Damien. This is our positive side. Yep, and then positive is always on this side of the battery. And if you are always confused, it never hurts to double check with the voltmeter. One right here. Let me double check these. So, I just did. so if you take the positive end of a voltmeter and a negative end of a voltmeter, and read the voltage, you will have a positive value. I'm going to try to show this to you guys here. <laughs> screen's kind of dirty. Yeah, it is. So positive to negative, and you get positive 23.77. But now if you flip them, with the positive on this side and the <laughs> negative on this side, you get a negative 23.77. So that's when you know that's wrong. So you got to have the polarity to be right. Polarity, polarity matters. matters. There you go. <laughs> All right, James, what are we doing next? Next, we're going to do the uh, two-module harness. As you can see, it's already plugged in the bottom there. It's a little more tricky for me to do, but at the top here, you just get the plug to plug. Here's the click. She's in there good. You put the uh, female to male on your V2. Make sure it clicks as well. All right. Nice. All right, so I'm going to do the output side. And now if you have only one module there, that's where you use the shortening plug so the V2 can communicate with just the one module. But if you have, let's say you have three modules, you would also still use a shorting plug at the end of a four module harness. Mm -hmm. And also, I don't know if they touched on this before, in the previous video we have uh, the extensions, the four module extension and the four module, module just as is. So we have all those in stock if you are interested in buying them. And the first thing I'll mention before Daniel gets it, make sure you guys are being safe with it. I just like to put the orange covers on there so I don't yeah. do a little shock mess anything up. They have a lot of power in those small battery modules and if it makes any noises or <laughs> gives off any smells that probably means you should run away. <laughs> All right. But the goal of using our V2 here is to identify any problems that might happen especially like if you have a bad cell in there mm -hmm. the V2 will not start just because it wants to protect the system. So what we have here, actually I didn't explain this, is a Syngineer <laughs> 6 kilowatt, uh, a 24 Four. volt uh, system, and that's why we have the battery modules connected in parallel, so that will give us 24 volts. And this does uh, 24 volt DC into 240 AC, and uh, you can buy these on our store as well, we have them for sale. And this is a good uh, purchase for RV guys, if you're out there. Camping guys, yep. Uh, yep, because you would just need this, and that's 10 kilowatts right there, and you can power a lot of devices with this. 6.6 .6 kilowatts is quite a bit. <laughs> um, Alright, so. Let's see, what do we need next? So, we'll show them, we'll show you how to switch this on. So, wires connected there. Mm -hmm. Make sure everything's tight. Make sure everything's tight. If you see, I'm trying to move this wire. I moved a bit, so <laughs> that means it needs to be tightened. Shouldn't move like that. See, that's tight. Alright, James. You want to hit the power switch? Yeah, we can hit the power switch. So you see the 12 volt come on first, That's which is that light. blue light. And then what's the red light again, Damien? <laughs> yeah, good catch this. The red is for the negative contactor. So what happens is now it's initializing, and then once it uh, communicates with the BMS, you'll see the, green, uh, re the red light come on first, <laughs> which makes the negative contactor click. So what happens with loads like this is you don't want the wires to connect immediately because that can spend too much current. So right now is the pre-charge duration. So we had that and now we have the... Seven seconds, ten seconds? You can customize it with the display. You can set it to whatever you want. Now we have the green light come on which means now both wires are connected to this. So now if we switch this on, well we don't have this on video but <laughs> right here we see this power comes on. So for troubleshooting, we have a lot of uh, customers uh, have problems where the 12 volt comes on and these don't. And that usually happens if there's a bad module or if there's some bad communication. So if this plug is not plugged in properly or the shorting plug is not there, we have problems that make it not come on. And if you saw the time, and I guess we can show them again, <laughs> switch it off and switch it back on, 
this first initial time is for the configurations to come up, and we'll show a video of that right after this on how to set up the configurations. And at this point, it can connect to the BM, uh, the internet, the through a wireless hub. And if you don't have a Wi-Fi module, we can you can purchase a wireless hub online for thirty-five bucks. That's around there. And then, so basically, what it does is it communicates with the display at this point, and then now you see that, and now that's the pre-charge duration where it balances the voltage here with this, and we have a pre-charge res resistor in there which lets it do that slowly, rather than send a high amount of current through it and short the contactors, which we do not want to do. <laughs> do we have a light to where we can turn it on and see? We do, actually. Let's see. So, what we have here is a small light to show you that our inverter is working. <laughs> what we say is correct. What we say is correct, <laughs> yes. Okay, plug that in, and now when I switch on the inverter, Wait for it to power up. That comes on. Do you have light? No. Do you press it properly? <laughs> it's making power. Oh. As you go. Wrong way, Daniel. I switched it on to power saver, so it needs to be not on power saver. Not on power saver. Now I hear this cranking. Bingo. Bingo bongo. Light. Bingo bongo. So that's a quick tutorial on how to... <laughs> Power save. Connect the V2 and get this switched on. And next, we'll go on to showing the configurations and the initial setup. Good. Stay with us. Stay with us. <laughs> Cut.